I had spoken with over 40 folks on this podcast, and a few of them were the stars in the sense that their episodes have gotten the most listens, at least according to my RSS account analytics. I won't say who all of them are, but one of them is our guest today on this episode. David Cady spoke with me about a year ago on about his book, Religion of Fear, the true story of the Church of God of the Union Assembly. <clears throat> this book shook me up pretty much because I had no idea of this part of the history of Woodfield County and really the country. Today, we sit down with David Cady to talk about his new projects and former ones in addition to Religion of Fear. Listen in. Good afternoon, David. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Yeah. Doing great. So you, I think, are a busy guy, and I understand you're finishing another novel. So tell us about it. Oh, yeah. I just uh, finished it, the first draft, about two or three months ago, and I'm starting on the, uh, I'd call it the rewrite, or just flashing and dashing. And uh, this took me, this novel took me about four years. Ooh. And most of my fiction, a nonfiction work doesn't take me very long. And you, maybe nine months, I can have it all finished. But this has been a four-year project because it is about true events. And about 90, I'd say 99% of the stuff in it happened, really. Mm-hmm. Um to give you a little background, it's happened in uh, World War II and the Baltic states, uh, which were held by Russia until the Germans invaded Russia and took Latvian, uh, Lithuania, Estonia away from the Russians. I was able to get a... Two unpublished memoirs of people who were present there, Jewish people, and who went through and lost everything, all their family except for themselves. And they, uh, but they gave me this unpublished memoir with no German names because evidently, well, there was a few, but they didn't know what all was going on. So my job then was to try to fill in all their blanks. On what happened to them. And then I turned it into a novel because I wanted to add the dialogue and make it real, really seem real. And even though I have the dialogue in it, the Germans were so meticulous about their records that they even kept notes on their speeches and stuff that they kept. So I was actually able to put in some stuff they did. And to give you a little background, what I found out about in Reg- Rega, uh, Latvia, where this was a Rega, it was a ghetto. And they killed all the Latvian Jews except for about 4,000. And they were, and left Lithuanian. And there was hardly any in Estonia. But uh, there were about 90,000 Jews in uh, Latvia, and they killed them all but 4,000 before they even started murdering Jews in Germany, Uh 41. Uh And actually, most of them were killed in the beginning by the Latvians themselves because the Jews actually— were in charge of the towns and the cities and the money, and they saw a good good way to steal it from them. Mm-hmm. And then the Germans came in, and, of course, uh, they killed, they put the Latvians, 20, about 30,000 of them in a ghetto, which is the poorest part of the town in Rega, the southern portion. And I had several, about three or four books, that were some of them written in German. I had to get them translated. Uh, how they uh, uh, kill these people, 
and they would they marched them out on two different occasions to uh, they uh, to a forest, and it's called the Rumbula Massacre. And then the Russians that they had captured, uh, they had them dig trenches, huge trenches, and they had already killed about uh, thirty three thousand in uh, uh, parts of Poland by then, and it was a guy named Jekyll. Um, yeah, I think Germany, they call it Jekyll. And uh, he had uh, come up with a new method of killing Jews. He called sardine packing. <laughs> and he had those people, most of them were women and children and old people, line up and lay down. They'd take their clothes off. They were allowed to wear their underwear unless they were real pretty Jews, women, and then they didn't have to. They wouldn't let them do that. And Frederick Yeckel then had his men, uh, 12 at a time, go up behind him with a, with a machine pistol to shoot one shot in the back of each one of them's head. And in November the 30th, when this first one came about, they killed 14,000 people in about 12 hours. And that's about one every three seconds. And it was so fast. And they used German guns that held 50 bullets. I'll just call them bullets. And they could set it on a single shot. So they got a half of them killed. These are Latvian Jews now. And they took a week later. Actually, it was eight days later on December the 8th. They took the rest of them, except for about 4,000 men. They kept that they had good jobs to help the German people. And they Ooh. shot another about 11,000 that day. And most of them men and women. So they, they cleaned out all the Latvian Jews, and then they took the German Jews, not the Polish Jews, not the uh uh, you, not the Yugoslavian Jews, but the German Jews, and ship them to Riga Ghetto. And, and that's, of course, there was a lot of um, bad blood between the Latvian Jews and the German Jews. And my story, basically, after this tragedy, is how these people lived in this ghetto were actually, a lot of them were killed there, mm-hmm. starved to death. And then what happened to them is they ex- left there. And then when, once the Germans started losing the war, then they started, decided they'd just kill all the Jews. And it wasn't until, I, I don't know if you've heard of the, the uh, Bossy uh, Conference in Berlin, but mm-hmm. that's when uh, Heinrich, um, not Heinrich, but um, Reinhard Hendrich decided that the final solution. Mm-hmm. And this, one of the guys that was in on it was the guy from Latvia who had killed all these people in Latvia. And he's in the story. So I have one chapter done and dedicated to them deciding how they're going to kill the Jews. And mm-hmm. I've tried to do this, and I don't want to spend too much time on it, but I tried to do this in such a way that I could write it from two viewpoints. I wrote it from Mm -hmm. the German viewpoint, from the officers who did the killing, some of them that didn't do the killing, and also through the Jews who were being killed. And I tried to find everything I could on why and how they did this, how they were physically capable of killing these people. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if I found it, but I did put something down Uh and how they did it and why they did it. Right now, we're going through a time where it's just amazing to me that uh, people, you know, still use the Jews as a scapegoat, I guess. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you, they can, from what I've read and what I know since the... um, the World War II and since the Holocaust, I say. And the word Holocaust wasn't coined until the the trial, the Nuremberg trials. That's when it was called. Oh. We wasn't called that before. And But now I know, see, the Jewish motto is we'll never 
it'll never happen again. Mm -hmm. That's their main motto. So I know what's happening in Israel now. They would never stop. And 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 the people can protest and do everything they want to. Mm -hmm. But it will never change their mind after what happened at the Holy mm -hmm. Right. We might change the United States mind about helping them, but not necessarily. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I was going to ask you if you had been there, uh, if you, you know, would want to travel. That's big. Latvia, they're really far up there. That's very northern. Yeah. And it's yeah. cold. It's, yes. That's what I was thinking. <laughs> so, um, so how did you get interested in writing about that? I have a friend, a girl that I went to school with in high school. And then we went and took graduate courses together at University of Georgia. She's uh, my wife's age, and her name is Janet Rosenbaum. And um, her her grandmother was is a survivor who's of the Holocaust. Okay. Her, her name was Solinger, and she's the main character in this book. Not the girl I went to school with, but her grandmother, who was in her late 40s, when this mm -hmm. happened, and she survived. Mm -hmm. And Janet's mother came to America on the last ship that was allowed to leave Brussels in 1940. The war had already started in Poland. I think. Mm -hmm. And England had already declared war in France, and she was able to get out. But the rest of her family, except for her grandmother, the, uh, this girl's mother was killed during the during the oh, Holocaust, uh, and oh, I got a memoir. And so I had I'd seen it back before I ever started writing, and I happened to think about it. So I contacted Janet and asked her if I could use her grandmother, and it's only a twelve page single space memoir, mm -hmm. but. It was just full of information. Then I found out she was real good friends, the grandmother, with a girl, a woman who's named Janet Wolf. And Janet was a survivor and a good friends with Janet's <laughs> grandmother. And she wrote a memoir, which was published in German only. And getting that and getting it uh, put into English, because I don't read German. Mm -hmm. And it, and she mentions my this girl's grandmother, and so it just went from there. Then I have another person, and I'm show this just to you, who wrote this book. Mm -hmm. and uh -huh. She actually was 13 years old, 14 years old when it happened, um, when she was in Riga, and she was the aide to Janet's grandmother, who is the star to this, and she mentions her in this book. Oh. So Janet didn't know any of this. Hmm. And so I did the research and found out, and then, of course, I had her book, I had Janet Wolf's book, and I had the, the memoir that Janet gave me, and then an uncle of hers and an unpublished memoir. And then I ended up finding three, four, no fiction, no Nonfiction book has been written about this. Mm -hmm. In fact, the the Latvian people paid this uh, professor ten thousand dollars to do one, and he never did it. Mm -hmm. And so now I don't know what happened. I'm not. I didn't. I, they don't even know, evidently, in Latvia in uh, Riga that I'm uh, doing this book, but. Uh, I don't know. Probably I'm going to have to find a publisher because I uh, might go try an agent. But because UT only publishes fiction, I mean nonfiction. Yeah. Okay. So I'm probably going to yeah. have to go in another direction there. I know uh, my main contact, Dr. Hood, says Mercer. Yes, they they have fiction there. They yeah, fiction. so we might try in several different directions there, mm -hmm. and we'll just see what happens. That's the part I hate. I like to write, and it's this all this other stuff. That, yeah, you know, <laughs> that's really a common uh, thing that writers say. <laughs> yeah, 
they really don't like the um, pu- the uh, marketing and the all that other stuff. Yeah, yeah. So, um, and um, I'm I'm glad that you agreed to come on because last time it was about mid May of 2023. We did not get to talk about your other writing, and I count three other novels on Amazon. But so, books um, I did write. I started when I was 50 years old. Oh, okay. Uh, when I turned 50, I said, if you're going to get this done, which I'd already wanted to do, you better get started. And I was still teaching at the time at Dalton High School. Yeah, I hadn't. And I just did it at night and on weekends and didn't get a lot of sleep, didn't need a lot of sleep. And then I wrote one, and it was so bad. It was a book which never was published. And then I started reading books and going to conferences and trying to figure out how to write. Uh-huh. It's, it's it's so much different than most people think because. Yes. It is. Yes. <laughs> Not the ones I wrote were. were uh, yeah. They were challenged. Yeah. Several, and that was the last one before I did. But it was uh, The Handler, which is right. based. Based on snake handling, I had a lot of truth into that one. Yeah, now that's what got me with Doctor Hood because he's a big, he's uh, oh. teaching uh, religion and uh, religion co- religious courses down in Spencer in Chattanooga, and he overseen. I don't know if you've heard about Heaven Come Down, which is a documentary about snake handling, and. Mm. He did that one. So oh, okay. I kind of took stuff from his uh, his ideas and wrote those books. Uh, yeah, I know there was a book or a, a film a while, long time ago, decades ago, uh, something about Salvation on Sand Mountain or something like that. And it was about snake handlers up yeah. there on Sand Mountain. Yeah. yeah. But they're still there. Yeah. yeah. And there's yeah. one in Cedar Town. Oh, my. Okay. Um, and Dr. Hood wanted to take me to one of them, and I said, no, I'll just not go. Didn't you teach science, though, when you were? I didn't teach science, but and, and when I was a child, my dad was a, a minister, mm-hmm. a, kind of an evangelistic minister for a while. He did a lot of things, but for a while he did that. And he did take me to one in Resaca. You're talking about a long time ago, and he didn't know it was a snake handling church. Oh, wow. So we sat in the back, and I got to see, and that made a big impression on about a 10 or 11 year old kid. I bet it would. And so, oh, anyway, it seems like everything I've written has to do with religion, though. Well, yeah. So, you've got the, the handler, uh, which you did pretty. Kind of a while back on that one, didn't you? That yeah, was two thousand seven. Two thousand. Okay. Was that? that was my first one. And it was actually uh, nominated for Georgia Author of the Year. Oh. And, okay. Uh, and then, of course, uh, in the religion of fear, I got uh, what they call the uh, uh, second place, but they have it. Uh, they call it finalist. The author of the year. Oh, I, excellent. Okay. I know, and I think um, the guy who beat me out was he had died, and that was uh, the representative Lewis. Oh, yeah. With, with Martin Luther King. Uh huh. Yeah, he had done a book. Uh, what's his name? Marvin? No. John. John Lewis. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and he had written a book, and it was actually a uh, uh, a cartoon book. I don't know if you've seen it. It, it, <laughs> it, it, it was good, though. I thought it was really well. I think, I was it called a graphic novel? Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's interesting. Big man. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. Okay. Um, and then your next book was Fatal Option, and it's a sequel to The Handler? Okay. Actually, I didn't. Uh, both books were written at the same time, and the the guy uh, Gene Gabriel Moore, who set me up on that, um, 
He's dead now. He was, uh, he had his own PBS show and he was, did book reviews and uh-huh. he, uh, well, edited for Peachtree Publishing. And at the time, and he uh, edited that book for me and he taught me into changing it to two books. Okay. Okay. And he said, new writers just do not have a hard time getting long books published. Yes. yes. I guess that didn't bother Margaret Mitchell. <laughs> well, that was, that was in the 30s. Nowadays, it's it's so competitive. And people don't really want super long books now. You know, <laughs> um, they I, I have a friend who uh, she's a wonderful writer. But her first novel was is two hundred fifty thousand words, and I'm surprised that anybody published it. It's very good, but um, it's so long. <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, look, I'm just finished. I've got a, not quite one hundred fifty thousand. Um, oh wow, bigger than I wanted, but yeah, and um, I'm I'm, I'm, I'm trying to swap it down. So yeah, you can't pull a, a six year period. And all that happened right. to these people and mm-hmm. in a short amount of time. And it was a lot longer than I thought it was going to be. Yeah. Yeah. But, so no, no, I'm going to do another one <laughs> about, about the Holocaust. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. That's a pretty hard. I mean, you pick some hard uh, topics. I mean, we talked about this last time with religion of fear. That was a. Um, that was a tough book to read. Um, and then, you know, you, what you went through to write it and, and the people you had to talk to and the stuff they went through. It was just, um, I know it was hard on you. Well, it was. And, you know, I'm still getting something almost every week from some of these people. I bet. You yeah. Know? And they're, I could write another book on just the emails I've got. Mm-hmm. From people that want to tell me their story. Of course, I I have talked some of them on the phone and recorded. But I don't know. I didn't. I don't really plan on doing another book about that. Uh huh. UT did mention, and by the way, they've got a new uh, director now. Uh, and Hannah I forgot her last name. Right now, it's hot off the bat, but. Uh, She's the new director, and Scott Danforth, who did all my editing and stuff, he's retired. So mm-hmm. that's kind of changed that around for me. But, yeah. Well, it's interesting you bring that up. I'm, I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but um, this is on this particular um, um podcast. It is on YouTube. It's just sound, though. It's not video. Yeah. and. You have a lot of you have a lot of listens on there, and somebody put a comment. They said, um, "I think this is a great thing, Mister Katie has done. Even though I lived through this hell, I could not put the book down." And the way they wrote that, I wasn't sure exactly their flow of thought, but um, you know that was. You know, when when you read that, what do you think when you, you see those kinds of comments? Mm-hmm. Well, I, I think since the I don't know and I'm probably uh, I, I don't want, I was going to better not say it, but I'm thinking I've seen a falling in the church. Their their membership has really super declined. I don't know where. Yeah, I would imagine whether it was the book that I wrote or or it's the sign of the times. It's hard. To, it's hard to actually brainwash people nowadays. I think, of course, it's, mm-hmm. it's not all the time to, to brainwash people like they did. You know, there's too many other outlets uh-huh. to get information. Mm-hmm. We're all brainwashed, I guess, to a certain extent. Anyway, well, it's just more a much more open society where people aren't going to let that. Ha- I mean, they might let it happen, but they're less likely to. I had some people ask me uh, what I was doing right there with that. And uh, why, why weren't I telling the whole story? And, I, you know, I just 
if I if I didn't I had to have proof, you know, you're you're you have to have proof. You can't just mm-hmm. double everybody says. Right. And so I had to do a lot of um checking. And by the way, this thing about the Holocaust that I'm writing now, or Phoenix writing is still working on what I read got to are still working, but there were so many contradictory things in the history of the Holocaust. Like even dates that these happened. Uh I guess on we got a friend that we that. Hold on, just a second. No, stop it. I have two big dogs and they just. I got one little one and uh, not a little one, a huge one in the days. She's in there right here. Yeah. Guy. Anyway, what I was saying was there were so many contradictories. Like, okay, for example, uh, some people had them, the Latvian killing uh, 24,000 Jews, some people, Latvian Jews, at the two massacres in um, Rumbula Forest. And by the way, you find all that on the encyclopedia. People want to check and see what happened, but not to the extent that I wrote about. It. Yeah. But, uh, there were some people said there was 30,000 killed. And even though the Germans kept good records, and at the end when they started uh, losing the war, and I'll tell you, they started losing the war in 1942 when when Stalingrad started fighting back and the Russians started fighting back. Well, then the Germans changed their tactic, and their new enemy then became the Jews, and that's when they... Did the gas chambers that Oswald, um, Treblinka and all these places. And I don't go into those places because everybody that's written about the Holocaust writes about all these death camps. Right. And they didn't have to be in a death camp to get killed. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I think you're telling a story that's maybe a little different. Um, for my own sake, I would say this, or for your own sake, I'd say, uh, I tried not to hide much. In fact, I tried to tell it exactly the way it happened. Mm-hmm. And they were like during the Latvian uh, the massacre at um, uh, in Latvia, uh, there were three women who survived it, actually were shot. And didn't die and crawled mm. out of the pit and survived. And one of them wrote a book, I Su- Survived Rumbula. And of course, it's all her story. Was well, her story is in my book. And she talks about when well, she knows she's going to die, when well, she knows she's got to go up there and lay down in that pit and let somebody shoot her in the back of the head. She talks about her feelings and how she pulled her own hair out, how she screamed, how she didn't want to die, and how she ran around. And she didn't, t- she was like 29 years old. And she, then she was not shot. So she crawled out and crawled and survived the whole war in the forest around Latvia and wrote the book about it. So wow. what I'm saying is I, I put a lot of, it's going to be a hard read. Yeah. Except one is the, the uh, religion of fear. This one, there would be times that I just had to shut it off myself mm-hmm. and get away from it because it's so depressing. But I think it's time, time now to start telling these stories and try to tell how these people felt and why they killed the Jewish people and why the, and I tried to bring this out. And I, the only thing I can say is they're a convenient target. Mm-hmm. All I can say. Yeah. I could not find, there's so many things about uh, having Jesus crucified and all of this, but that, 
But the Christian, if you believe that, then you believe you don't believe in, you know, murdering yes. people. So that's, yes, exactly. that's such a, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It's not oxymoron, but it's a it's an irony. Yeah. 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 And, but anyway, I'm just, yeah, it's, uh, the, it's such a study in how people can justify what they do or what they get caught up in. It's, uh, it's amazing. So, okay, a couple of the questions since you're you're pretty much into this writing thing. Um, you know, what is it about writing fiction? Because fiction's hard. It's you know, you said the fellow was given ten thousand dollars to write a novel, and he probably couldn't do it. <laughs> you know, even though they paid him. Um, do you do you enjoy writing fiction? And I do. Yeah. Uh, I enjoy all the process of writing. Okay. It's crazy because I don't consider myself. They say all writers are introverts, but I don't consider myself. No, I don't think you are either. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I enjoy it. And I don't spend four or five hours a day. It's about my limit mm-hmm. because I think I get washed out. And I, and I imagine a lot of a lot of writers would get washed. I hear people write 12, 10 hours, 12 hours a day. I don't see how they do it. Not I, for a long time, no. And I had to pull away everything I did there. Then. Yeah, yeah. The writing <laughs> process is not what everybody thinks it is. No, it's not. So <laughs> what benefits does writing fiction have for you personally, though? Um, what benefits? I mean, me? it, yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, it's always nice to know people read your work. Mm-hmm. And I hear all kinds of people, even my son says, oh, you need to write just for the enjoyment of writing. But after you write, you want people to read it. Thank you for saying that. <laughs> yes. I mean, you know, you, do, yeah, I, uh, you want your story out there. Right. Mm-hmm. So that's yeah. the hard part step <laughs> I I try to find it made it easier now for people to. Then there's some trash out there too. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. Um, so, as a writer, do you do much in terms of what is called marketing? Do you travel to a lot of conferences and stuff? I I do as much as I can. Like right now, doing this podcast with you. Yeah. I, and I don't turn down any, I, unless I did turn down one uh, book club meeting. I go to book clubs around in the area. And I had told this friend that used to live next door to me, uh, I told her on religion affairs, she said, yeah, I'll come do it. And she says, we'll do it in March or something. And this was last year. And uh, so it, I finally found out, and I said, now, where do I come? She says, well, do you know where uh, Gainesville, Georgia is? We're talking <laughs> I said, oh, no, no, no. Yeah. Marketing, yeah, it's it's a very important part. Even going with a, a company or a publisher like UT Press, yeah. they don't do enough marketing that I don't think any of them does. Uh, publishers, unless the author gets out and does a lot of his own stuff. Not much Not anymore. Not anymore. Yeah. yeah. The author has to do. You got to get out there and push it. Stuff. Yeah. And for and that's a, you know, you have to be, I hate to put it this way. You have to be kind of obnoxious about it. Yeah. You know, I mean, <laughs> you just have to. Let it be known that's what you do. But, you know, I think about it that if people, I mean, I don't think either one of us plans to make a, a fortune off of our writing. You know, um, we're probably too too old to do, <laughs> you know, to, to come, be a millionaire after it's all over. But um, we do want we do want to make at least some money and we do want to make more than and we want to do better than break even. We want to make a profit from our work because it's such hard work. And I think, well, I know people who are musicians and nobody seems to mind that they go someplace and get paid for being a musician. So why are people trying to get us to give them free books? You know, this is my work. 
what I do. And um, yeah, it's it's you know, hard. Any you people want to, well, I guess you get the same thing. How about a copy of your book? And, yes. Okay. Uh, well, I paid for this. I paid for money for this. You need to, you need to pay me some money for this. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and then you get right. You know what? I just got through reading not to. I read to a lot mm-hmm. uh, at night when I'm too tired to write. And I just got through reading uh, A Movable Feast by mm-hmm. Chris Hemingway. Oh. And I did not realize, and this really made me feel good. You know, all, uh, you know, he's pretty successful. Yeah, he, he could not make it on what he made from books. Right, he married into the money. Yeah, and into his wife actually kept him up uh-huh. because she was from one of his wives. Yeah, yeah. So. Her, I think her name was Gellner. Yeah, she um, she had money. Well, yeah, he married a lot, and he had women with money. Yeah. So, well, they lived such an extravagant lifestyle, you know, going off to. Africa and places like that. I want, yeah, I wonder about that too. So that how some of those people actually lived the way they did. Um, so, um, I'm sure the big writers like Patterson and, uh, yeah, Daniel Steele and all those, they make uh-huh. a lot of money. But I, I know the majority of writers don't make enough to uh-huh. live up. No, and they those people have been around a long time too. So, um, mm-hmm. yeah. So when you aren't writing, which you apparently do a lot, <laughs> what do you spend your time on, David? What do I do? What? What do you do when you're not writing? You play pickleball. Yeah, I play golf. Play golf, yeah, good. I play golf two days a week. Oh, okay. and that's about a four and five hour. Yes, it is. Mm-hmm. And I. Really enjoy. I can get out there, and that's one of the only things I can do that actually takes my mind totally off. Okay. Yeah. And, everything. and that's one of the things. And I, I do gardening, but not much. Mm-hmm. We've been talking with Mr. David Cady of Dalton, Georgia, an author who explores the human condition through researching and writing about people who use power and religion for their own ends, and who writes a downright good story in the process. Thank you for being with us again, David. Well, thank you for having me. My pleasure. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye.